This is part two of how to stop your patient bleeding to death. When we're dealing with a bleeding patient, there are so many things to remember, some of which need to be done all at once by your team. I like to use a cognitive aid, a quick reference guide, and this is the one from our emergency department. In the last video, I went through page one, which is all the general measures you need to remember to manage that patient's bleeding. Now we're gonna talk about the specific measures on page two, depending on the site and nature of hemorrhage, starting with the head and neck region. We're gonna think about controlling scalp wounds with staples or sutures and local anesthesia with adrenaline and applying pressure. Managing anterior epistaxis with pressure, adrenaline, and a specific device for nasal packing. In posterior epistaxis, we may need to put a balloon catheter of whatever manufacturer type and inflate the posterior balloon with air. If a patient comes in with a post tonsillectomy bleed, we put pressure on that bleed using a McGill's, McGill's and adrenaline or TXA soaked gauze and consider some nebulized TXA. Looking next at trauma patients. If it's penetrating junctional trauma, it's difficult to get compression on that hemorrhage. We may need to put a pediatric Foley catheter into the wound and inject the balloon with saline and clamp the Foley to stop it draining the bleeding. We'll suture the catheter in place until we can get definitive in theater operative control. If there are fractures to the pelvis or long bones, we will bind and splint those bones. For arterial bleeding from a limb, we'll put direct pressure, we'll provide elevation, and we'll put a tourniquet on if still bleeding. For maxillofacial trauma with severe facial hemorrhage, we may need to do manual reduction of displaced mid-face fractures. We would intubate the patient with a double suction setup and provide balloon catheters and bite blocks and a collar to stabilize that mid-face on the mandible and stop the mandible from moving. Onto the so-called medical bleeding, depending on region. If you have a patient who's having life-threatening hemoptysis, we would consider nebulized TXA. Imaging to localize the site of hemorrhage, we may need to selectively intubate the non-bleeding lung and get the patient to bronchoscopy or interventional radiology to control the hemorrhage. Patients who are vomiting blood might need an urgent endoscopy. And if we think this is variceal hemorrhage, we would treat them with turlipressin to reduce portal pressures and provide balloon tamponade with a Sengstark and Blakemore tube. For intracranial hemorrhage, our priority is to control hypertension. In a subarachnoid hemorrhage at the moment, we would aim for a systolic blood pressure below 140 and other intracranial hemorrhage below 160, depending on how high it was to start with. These are not hard targets, but a guide, and these will change as international guidelines are updated. We would reverse any anticoagulation the patient is on using guidance from page one of the quick reference guide. And our preferred agent in our department is clavidipine with the loading dose and maintenance doses as described on the quick reference guide. For obstetric hemorrhage, we would think about which trimester the bleeding is in and get a fast scan to identify the issue uh, or formal ultrasound to find the ectopic pregnancy. We would consider cervical shock as a cause of the shock presentation and examine and remove any products from the os. In antepartum hemorrhage in late pregnancy, we want urgent obstetrics and gynecology input uh, with imaging to identify the site of the bleeding and make an assessment of fetal position and viability. For postpartum hemorrhage, we will consider the four T's, tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombin or abnormal coagulation. Remembering that by far the most common cause is uterine atony, atony, lack of tone in the uterus. And we would massage the uterus manually, give IV syntocinon or oxytocin, consider manual aortic compression and balloon tamponade with a device called a Bacri balloon, which also had its, has its own quick reference guide in our department and get definitive operative or interventional radiology control of the hemorrhage. And finally, as described in the last video, if it's a pediatric patient, on this page, we have reminders of volumes of infusions for packed, rails, packed red cells, plasma, cryoprecipitate, and platelets, and 
loading doses of TXA and calcium gluconate. That is page two of the quick reference guide, a two page, one sheet PDF that we have on an app and also physically in our emergency department as a cognitive aid to help us remember all these steps immediately at the bedside for a patient who's trying to bleed to death so as a team we can save their life. Click in the links below for part one of this video and also to access a PDF of the quick reference guide. Thanks for listening.